Good morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church, San Antonio. We are so glad to be with you in worship today. Please take a moment to look at our website and sign in on the online fellowship pad. There you can also find ways to contribute to your tithes and offerings. We hope that you'll also take a moment to look at our bulletin. You can follow that along in the worship service and also find out about the many things that you can get involved with here at First Presbyterian Church in the weeks and the months ahead. For now, enjoy worship as we continue to love Christ, love one another, and love the city. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks. Happy Sunday. Really excited to see all of you here. Please welcome. Come on in. Find a seat. Uh, my name is Kara Weaver, and I am so excited to worship with y'all today. Um, a few things to note before we get started. One, there are some stewardship. Well, one, it's Stewardship Sunday. Yeah, yeah love that. And then there are some um, documents. At, there's a paper at the be, uh, front of house that if you haven't received that, feel free to go grab it. It has some information about Stewardship Sunday that Becky will be going over during today's sermon. Um, with that, again, we are so excited to worship with you. So I invite you to stand up and join me in our call to worship today. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions, even your male and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit. If you'll pray with me. God, thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us here to worship you. God, we love you. Thank you for bringing us into your family as sons and daughters that get to join in in the kingdom of Christ as his brothers and sisters. God, open up our hearts today. Allow the Holy Spirit to fill this presence in this church today. God, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stay standing as we sing together. So give thanks to the Lord. Here we go. Give thanks, give thanks to the Lord our God is a mercy. Renews us with steadfast love. In our coming, in our going, He's faithful.
sing with me. Blessed are those who run to him. Blessed are those who run to him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek his face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken. Come on, come on and praise the together as we declare affirmation of our faith.
through the words of the Apostles' Creed, answering the question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. I'll remind you that there are friendship pads on the seat somewhere in, in, the, in the row and ask you to find them and use them, uh, fill out your name. This is the tip of the iceberg of learning to love each other by learning to know our names. And so if you have someone in your row that you're not familiar with, make sure that you take a look at the pad and, and call them by name before you leave today. Also, if you're a first time visitor, ask the ushers at the door, we have a gift for you. Uh, we have a gift bag and that's, uh, that's for you if you're a first time visitor and we want you to have information about our church. This is normally the time when we would receive our offering, but we're not doing an offering today. No, I joke. <laughs> our offering will be at the end. Our offering will be at the end and we'll do it together because today we are celebrating commitment um, and, and taking, making our pledges for the year and also receiving that as we join together as the church body coming forward together. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to come together here in this place as the body of Christ that we call First Presbyterian Church. We're so thankful for what you have established here, for what you have done in the past, what you are doing now, and what you have planned for us in the future. Challenge our hearts as we come together on this, this Commitment Sunday to show how much we care, how much we are involved, and how much we want to be involved in what you do here. We're thankful that your steadfast love endures forever and carries us through and encourages us in every situation. Father, we pray for members of our church, covenant partners who are going through hard times because of the loss of loved ones. There have been several memorial services and there are several scheduled in the next couple of weeks and this thanksgiving may be a lonely time or a hard time we pray that you would nurture their grief with the understanding that even though we grieve we do not grieve without hope because our hope is in the power and authority of Christ's death and resurrection. We're thankful too for what you are doing through the ministries of our church. What takes place inside these walls, what takes place in this city, and what takes place throughout the world. We're thankful for our local and global missions. And we pray that you would work through all who have a part in that and thank you for the opportunity that we have to share in your kingdom purposes through what you have called our church to do. 
We pray for our congregation. We pray for our leadership. We pray for your guidance and continued direction as we seek to understand how you want to use us in the days and weeks and months and years ahead. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your blessings. Help us to live as Jesus taught us to live and help us to love as Jesus taught us to love. And now in these moments together, help us to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Follow along on the screen or in your Bibles or whatever, whatever source you use as I read together. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And now for, for response, all flesh is grass and its beauty like the flower of the field. And the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Oh, don't we just love Pastor Joe? He's the best. He's got jokes, right? It's good jokes. When I was here or years ago, when he had first gotten here, we did a youth uh, urban plunge downstairs, or we were kind of all over, this, all over the church, and the youth kids gathered in a circle. Preston was in high school at the time, Preston, Preston Miller, who's on our staff, and we all chanted, we love Joe, we love Joe, and it kind of has become viral. So if I leave nothing with you today, it's that that we love Joe. No, uh, my name is Becky Pritchard. For those who do not know me, I'm grateful to be with you today. Welcome to those who are in town visiting for Thanksgiving or family members who are here, college students who've returned. We're grateful to be with you today. Um, today, I have a lot of mixed feelings. I, this is my last sermon here at First Pres. I've served on staff here for over 10 years, 10 and a half years. And yes, thank you. It's been a great, it's been a great 10 years. And um, it would be remiss if I preached my last sermon and didn't give a, a whooping boomer sooner. Am I right? Because did anybody watch? Yes. Are we okay? If you don't want to cheer for the Sooners, at least we can say boo to the, the uh, Alabama, right? The Crimson Tide. So yay, boomer sooner! For those of you who are faithful Sooners, you have been with me 
for 10 years, and I leave you, and I hope that you'll band together. And don't let those A&M and UTers be too harsh on you, because it's a lot. So in my last sermon, we had, I have to talk about my Sooners. But in all seriousness, it's so amazing the way the Holy Spirit works. As this sermon series was planned, and God was giving to uh, Bob what he wanted us to preach this fall, and it landed that this was my last sermon, and I get to preach on Revelation. And some would say, oh, yikes. uh." But this part of Revelation is the best dream, the best vision God has ever given to his people. And so we've been in a sermon series called Created to Dream. We've been talking about the dreams that God gives to his people, men and women throughout scripture. And this one today is the best one there ever is. And so we're going to look at this scripture passage today because this is good news And what else am I here for except to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, his gospel to his people. As Joe and Kara both mentioned, today is also our Stewardship Sunday, and you have these cards. Now, these cards, we're going to invite you to come forward at the end of the service to bring forward to literally lay at the altar, to lay it at the feet of Jesus. As we look at God's word to us through scripture, we have an opportunity after to respond to God's love for us by giving of our tithes and our offerings. As you know, we didn't have an offering, and so this will be the opportunity to bring up your weekly tithe, your weekly offerings that you want to drop in the basket, but also to look at where God might be calling you to serve, not only with your time and your talents, but with your treasures in this next year in 2025. Because as we're going to see in Scripture, God has been faithful from the beginning, the Alpha, all the way through the end and into eternity. And he will be faithful in 2025 and in 2026 and in 2027. So we have the opportunity to participate in God's kingdom for God's glory. So keep those cards with you. You'll have a chance to bring them up as we respond as a part of our worship to what God has been doing with us. So before we jump into looking at the scripture, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth... And the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this passage in Revelation 21 comes after many passages of death and destruction and fire and terrible, terrible visions of God fighting against evil. We see that at at chapter 20, the passage that comes right before this one, John's vision is that the evil one will finally be defeated, thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur. Death and Hades will finally be gone. It is over and God wins. So as we look at Revelation, we must acknowledge that scholars for generations have debated What revelation means? Is it really visions? Is it prophetic? Is it code? What is it? And there's lots of books in my office. Well, they're packed up now, but that I could show you that talks about all these different viewpoints of revelation. But the one thing that all scholars agree on is that revelation displays a fight between God and sin and the devil, and that in the end, Jesus wins. Woo! That's right. And so we can have faith and hope as we look at this passage that God wins against death and evil and it's gone and it's over. So in chapter 21, the tone shifts and John goes from talking about the vision of death finally being defeated to looking to a new future. John begins to describe the best he can in in human terms what happens next. He's trying to illustrate this vision that God has given him for what happens after death is defeated and what this new world will look like once evil is gone. He begins in verse 1 and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. So imagine this new heaven and new earth. This is the eternal home for the lamb, Jesus Christ, and his church, the bride, right? The people, we, the church, not first pres, but people. Um, This new reality will be completely different than the world in which we currently live because there there will be no sin, no death, no destruction or pain. The heavens and the earth have been totally transformed by the power of God through the defeat of sin. 
the first heaven and earth created in Genesis, when we look all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, we see God creates in seven days heaven and earth. He creates all of our world. He creates humans, Adam and Eve, and he says it is good. It was good. Creation was good. It's the paradise that God intended for his people. And unfortunately, in Genesis 3, we know that sin entered the story. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God by taking of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. And so this first heaven and earth is a place now where sin separates humans from God. It's a place of pain and destruction because of sin. It's a place of death and sorrow and mourning. And this is the world that we currently find ourselves in. But we have the end of the story. John is saying that heaven and earth, the one that we know of and live in right now, will be made new, will be transformed, will be renewed And what's so cool about this passage is that we see it prophesied in Isaiah 65, verse 17. Listen to this. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. And then Isaiah continues in verse 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. So we see these words were prophesied in Isaiah And they connect here to John's final vision about the new heavens and the new earth, showing that the story of God for his people, his love for his people, connects from the beginning of time before creation all the way until the end and into forever. Our Bibles are connected. We know the story because of God's love for his people. And this is not the only um, image of newness that we see in Scripture. We see this a lot, particularly Paul. When he talks to the Corinthians, he talks uh, and he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You guys got it. Yes, starburst all around. He is a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. Right, So when we believe in Jesus, we know that Jesus has already come. Jesus has already died. Jesus was resurrected to new life. And when we believe in him and follow him, we are made new. We are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God promises that the heavens and the earth will also be made new. Just like we have been made new through Jesus' death. When Jesus was raised from the dead, so too are we raised to new life in Christ. And God promises that in the future, all things will be made new. So John writes at the end of verse 1 that the sea was no more. Not only that these new heavens and new earth will be there, but it, he's talking about the sea. So why, why is he saying this? Well, it doesn't mean that there's no water anymore in the future, uh, new heavens and new earth. But the sea in scripture often represents chaos and rebellion. The sea, we just read about the lake of sulfur and fire. It can represent where all things bad happen. All the chaos exists. So what John is trying to communicate here is that all chaos will be brought to order. All rebellion will no longer be part of this new heaven and new earth. It will be transformed. And in this new heaven and new earth, John sees the vision of a holy city, a new Jerusalem as a bride adorned for her husband. So think about every city you've lived in in your life. I've lived in lots of cities. I've lived near LA. I've lived in Houston. I've lived in like all the high traffic cities in America, basically. And um, no, San Antonio is not worse. So I'm just letting you know that. But all cities that you've ever lived in are sinful cities because they are inhabited by sinful people. When we think about cities in scripture, we see Babylon, we see Rome, we see Sodom and Gomorrah. We see these cities where sin happens and people are led to pride and to jealousy, to idolatry. They lift up the things of their, this world, the sinful parts of them for their own glory. We often talk about like San Francisco should just fall off into the ocean because it's so broken and awful, right? Like, well, San Antonio's no better. I hate to say that. I mean, I'm not trying to make a statement with that. I'm just saying that we as people are broken people and we live in broken cities and we build broken things because of our sin. But this new city, this holy city is a new Jerusalem. It is the ideal city. It's literally paradise restored. It's back to that Adam and Eve in the garden dwelling with God in the paradise of the Garden of Eden. 
This is a place where God will dwell with his people in perfect harmony and peace. And I want to move my family there. Do you want to move your family there? Like when you think about where should we live next, this is the city that I want to live in. And as followers of Christ, we get to live in that city for eternity. We have hope in a future greater than everything we've ever seen. We can't even imagine it because of our human brokenness. But we have a promise from God about a holy city, an eternity that is harmony, that is full of harmony and peace. It's a hopeful vision. This is a hopeful vision not only for the first century Christians that John was writing this to, who were persecuted, who were waiting for answers to life's difficult problems, and they were experiencing such a mess This holy city is a peaceful image for them to hold on to, but it's not just an image, it's a promise. It's not just a floating thing like imagine if, wouldn't that be cool? It's a real thing written by God, given to John. Not only for the struggles and persecution of those in the early church, but us today as well. We are in a mess as a people. We have our own individual mess as we fight against sin in our lives. There's turmoil not only personally, but corporately in our city, in our country, and across the globe. Strife and division, poverty and injustice, war and threat of war. Persecution is happening in many places in our midst. And we pray for God's protection and power in the here and now. And this vision of the holy city that's to come brings with it a hope that sustains us in the midst of the messy world we live in. There is a new and perfect place coming, and it looks nothing like the world we know and experience here. So John continues in verse 3, says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. The dwelling place of God is with his people. He longs to be with his creation. God dwelled with Adam and Eve in the garden. God dwelled with his people in the wilderness after he freed them from slavery in Egypt. He dwelled with his people by sending his son Jesus as a baby to be with us, to live as flesh and blood human and fully divine, Emmanuel, God with us. As a sidebar, you know that the season of Advent is upon us. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent. It's a liturgical season that the church celebrates as we prepare our hearts to anticipate the birth of Jesus Christ on Christmas. Each Sunday of Advent, we eagerly anticipate the coming King, the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. You will see next week an Advent wreath in each of the services being lit by families in our church Counting the days and the Sundays until Christmas, when Christ is born as God with us. God wants to dwell with his people, and he loves his people so much that even though sin entered in the garden, he sent his only son as fully human and fully God, to be with his people and to be with them to the point of death on the cross and to die for all of us the death that we deserve and to be raised to new life. God loves his people that much. And when I say his people, I don't mean that just ethereally. I mean he loves you personally and he loves me. And he loves you so much, and he loves us so much that he's longed to dwell with us at every point in creation. And so he has a promise to dwell with us forever in eternity. Sin created a separation between God and humans. Jesus was sent to conquer sin on the cross so that we would no longer have separation from God. And that has already happened. The work is already done on the cross. So as people who are saved by grace through the love of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, now we have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit and look forward to the future in the new heavens and the new earth. But we still live in this world in the meantime. We're in what scholars call the in-between, the now and the not yet, the already and the what's to come, right? Where Christ has 
has suffered and died and was raised to new life, and we are a new creation in him when we believe and follow him. But the not yet is that the promise of God has not come to fruition, and death and sin have not been fully defeated. So in this meantime, we wait, joyful that we're saved and we're freed and we can live as freed people and hopeful that we will be freed forever and ever. God promises this people a future where God can finally and ultimately dwell with his people without sin and separation. Jesus was sent to dwell with us. And after he went away, he ascended into heaven and he said, but I'm sending a helper, a comforter. I'm sending the Holy Spirit to be in you and with you and among you. And the Holy Spirit is real. And Presbyterians sometimes have trouble remembering that because, you know, frozen, chosen. But real life... The Holy Spirit is here and in our midst, and not just in these walls, but everywhere. When we know and follow Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So Jesus came to dwell. The Holy Spirit dwells within us, and God promises his dwelling with us forever, for eternity. So let's continue in verse 4. The promise says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, not pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I'm going to read it again. I just want you to picture this. We read it, we're like, yeah, yeah, that'll be great. It's so great. No. But really sit with this image of what God promises. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, not pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Can you picture it? Is that the city that you want to live in? You want to move your family? You want to tell all your friends about that city? A city with no more pain and death. Can you imagine a world without pain, without sadness, without destruction? where you don't enter those dark places and feel like you can't come out, there is no more pain. All the things that are brought on by the curse of sin will be totally gone. Can you even imagine? I invite you to dwell in that image. When you feel like you can't go one more step, when you feel like you can't get out of bed in the morning, Dwell in that image of what is to come. Not only that the work has been completed on the cross by Jesus Christ and that you are forgiven and freed now, but that you have a hope for tomorrow. It gives us a reason to live. Verse 5 says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is a legitimate promise given in a vision to John, written down for us to know and to believe and to trust in this promise. God is making all things new, and he's doing that now through each one of us. He's calling us to himself. He's filling us with his love and grace. He's forgiving us of our sins and sending us out to do his work in the world. He doesn't need us, but he uses us for his glory on this earth. So that more and more people will come to know him so that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord so that death will be destroyed. So that we can live in this promise of eternity. This final part where God says it is done is very reminiscent of Jesus' last words on the cross. John 19, as he takes a drink from the sponge And after he drank it, he said, it is finished. And he took his last breath. Jesus died because God loves you. Jesus died because he wants to be with his people. And God promises this final consummation of freedom and peace. And he says, it is done. When death is destroyed, when sin is gone... The plan is finally complete, and God is with his people in peace. We think of this as the end, the end of the story. The book closes after this, and we move on with our, you know, that's the end of it, right? But what God is saying here is he's the alpha and the omega. God is the end. 
God isn't just part of the end and the story ends and, and, you know, great, we move on. God is forever and ever and ever and ever. God reigns in eternity. It doesn't end like we're used to in human terms. We're, we're, it's hard for us when we're in this in-between because we want a start and a finish. We want it to end. But God is forever. God existed before the creation of the earth, and he will exist forever and ever in the new heavens and the new earth. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end, and he's also in every part in between. He is with us eternally, now and forever. So as we think about this passage, we have a lot of hope for the future. But what do we do in the meantime now? when we still live on an earth that's broken by sin, when we still have pain and sorrow and tears and crying and death, when everything feels chaotic and we have no control, what do we do? We have hope that God has a promise for our future. We wait with hopeful anticipation for what is to come. We pray for Christ's return. Sometimes I find myself in the midst of a hard day just saying, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus, come Lord Jesus. And we invite our friends to move to that holy city with us. We say, you don't want to miss this. This is what true hope and true life is all about. You have to know who Jesus is because this is light in the midst of your dark time. This is hope in the midst of what a world that feels hopeless. Come and join not in a weird way, but in like a cool Jesus way, you know, like tell everybody about this hope where we will finally be free of the sin that has kept us separate from God. All evil will cease and God will reign forever and ever 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 and I'm gonna keep going and ever because it really is forever and ever. It's hard for us to believe that, but it truly is forever. Because we know the end of the story, we can endure the suffering of this earth with a hopeful perspective Sometimes when people read books, they want to read the end, right, before they, like, spend their time reading or they want to know what happens at the end. Or, like, had I known that OU was going to beat Auburn, I probably would have stayed up and watched the whole game because, you know, we usually lose. So, um, but I like to sometimes know the end of the story because it gives me some perspective on, like, how to enjoy it. Or, like, when you show your friends, like, a meme and you're like, just wait, just wait. Like, the funny part's coming. Just wait, right? Because you know the end. Friends, we know the end, We have the end of the story already illustrated for us. We know what to have hope in. And so because we know the end, we know that the sin and suffering in this world is not going to last forever, that it doesn't win in the end, and that when we feel at our lowest point desperate for something to change, we know that God promised that it will and that it has because of Christ Jesus. We can endure the suffering that we experience with integrity until the end, knowing that God reigns supreme. We can endure the suffering because we know that Christ suffered the worst death so that we could be forgiven and ultimately freed from sin. Because we know the end of the story, we can be encouraged to walk with Jesus and not lose hope. And because we know the end of the story, we have a reason to live, amen? And we have a reason to live abundantly. Because that's what God has promised us here and now. Abundant life, even in the midst of pain, and abundant life forever. So friends, don't lose hope. When it feels like everything's falling apart. When you feel like chaos is all that you experience. There's no order. You have no control. When your loved one dies... When your kids aren't following the Lord like you hoped they would and they're making decisions that make you scared. When you can't seem to find a job, you don't know how you're going to pay the next bill. When you have a relationship that's strained, a marriage or a friendship, a working relationship that is broken by sin and it feels irreconcilable, there's hope. When you feel like everything is out of control and the darkness will not end, remember that there is hope for today and even brighter hope for tomorrow. 
cling to the hope that God offers us. Remember that God is here and now. His spirit is with us. He is before us and he is the end. He is faithful to his promises. Be encouraged and sit in this image that is to come. Pull out Revelation 21 and remind yourself of this new heaven and this new earth, the new Jerusalem, the river of life that Jesus wins. And then share it with somebody that you know and invite people to know Jesus. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, we want to tell you more about him. We want to invite you and show you the hope that Jesus offers us, his children. If you're a longtime Christian, been coming to church your whole life, but you feel like you're in a dark spot, don't lose hope. We're going to have somebody up here praying at the end of the service. Come seek prayer for those dark moments. We are not alone. God gives us one another to encourage each other in fellowship as we wait with hopeful anticipation for the coming king to rule over sin and for the king to rule over sin and death. So today on this Stewardship Sunday, we have the opportunity to trust everything that we are and everything that we have to God. As I said, God uses us. He calls us to himself. He loves us and pours blessings upon us. And he asks that we respond to his love by giving back to him everything, everything. Callan was reminding us this morning about the widow's might, right? The widow that had two coins left. She had nothing left and she gives them. She gives it to, to God as her all, everything that she has. Even when we feel like we have nothing, we give it to God because he's given us our lives. So as I invite the, the band to come forward, I want you to remember that God's promises are true. That this new Jerusalem is real and it's coming. So let's let go of what we're holding so tightly to, knowing that it's all from God from the beginning and through the end. What we're holding on to doesn't solve any of our problems. Our control, our need for, for power, our need for pride, whatever it is that we're holding on to, our money, our homes, our, our kids, our families, we're trying to control and we're not letting go, but God is asking us to let go and to trust him, to lay our lives down for him so that we come and we're blessed again and again to be used for his glory. So in a moment, I'm going to say a prayer. After I pray, the band is going to play some music. It's an opportunity for you as you feel led to come forward and to bring your commitment cards. You may be saying, well, I give online. I don't have anything to write here. That's okay. You can bring the symbol of the card as a, as a moment of laying it at Jesus' feet. It doesn't have to have anything on it, but you know what God is calling you to give. If you're a child in here, you can write something on your card about how you feel God is leading you to give this next year. Maybe it's that you want to sing in the choir. Maybe you want to bake cookies for cookie hour. Maybe you want to be a greeter or an usher. We invite you as families to come forward, not just mom and dad's decision, but this is a family as you connect and commit your dedications to God. So as we sing this song, I want you to take a few minutes, fill out your cards, bring your, your, your weekly offerings up here and lay them on the altar, trusting God with everything. Let us pray. Gracious God, we love you. And we're thankful that you sent your, Jesus, your son Jesus to die for us. We're thankful that the work of salvation is already complete through his death and resurrection on the cross. And we're thankful that the, the promises of a new heaven and a new earth and a holy city that the promise is true. And we have hope in what is to come. So today, Lord, as you call us to serve you this year, as you call us to give of our time and our talents and our treasures, you call us to do this for your glory, not for our glory, not for First Pres, not for what we want here, not for our control. We don't give because we think that we have control over this. Once we give, Lord, we trust that you will do the work. So Lord, call us to you. May we listen. May we receive your love and grace and with gratitude come forward to dedicate our tithes and offerings to you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
I invite you to come forward as you feel led. Church, as you come forward, we invite you to stay standing and sing with us as we worship all together.
to remain standing as we pray that these tithes and offerings would be dedicated to the Lord, that as we give them, we trust that he will use them for his glory and he will use each and every one of us. So let us pray together. God of grace, we come with hearts of gratitude, filled to overflowing by your love. We're thankful for the gifts that you've given us. And we pray that as we lay them at your feet, you would use them for your glory. May we let go of control and stop trying to put them in places that we feel we need to put them, but let you, let you work in us, in this church, in the lives of those who are here. Lord, thank you for your love for us. Bless these tithes and offerings. May people who don't know your name, Jesus, as Lord, come to know you through the work of this church for your glory alone. It's in Christ's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Please remain standing as we sing together with gratitude the doxology together. considered a great privilege to have served this church for the last 10 and a half years. Thank you for allowing me to share my family and my life with you from up front. I'll be here a couple more weeks, so you'll be able to say goodbye, but I love you all very much. God loves you, and God has great plans for this church. I invite you to raise your hands as you receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and bring you peace, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you again for joining us here at First Presbyterian Church, San Antonio. For more information about FPC, our ministries, or ways that you can get involved, visit our website or follow us on our social media outlets. We look forward to being together with you again very soon.